thank you very much, everyone, for coming. This is an event, as I think all of you know, that's part of our ongoing 40th anniversary celebration that we're very excited about in general. We have, as you can see, five alumni here. We've um, hopefully chosen them carefully. Maybe they're all just random picks. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, they're going to share something of their life story and perhaps even their value systems with us. And I think they're very interesting. It's, it's, um, it's given me a chance to think again, as I think often, about how much, how much care we have, how, how much we care for the kids who go to school here. When you send your kids to school here, we don't promise we're going to love them. We only promise that we're going to let them be free. But uh, it turns out that we kind of get pretty fond of them. These, the people that are going to speak tonight are uh, very different from each other. And I think that in itself is a reflection of Sudbury Valley. They were here different numbers of years. They came here at very different ages. They are even very different ages now. <laughs> from when they came? From each other is what I meant. <laughs> but uh, they have quite a few attributes in common, and I think they're attributes that you find in pretty much all of our graduates, which is they're very competent. They uh, set high standards for themselves in their lives. And that will come through to you in what they say just because it can't help it. It comes through in everything they talk about. And they're very brave people. They were brave as current students are. They were brave to come here in the first place. They were brave to trust themselves to get their own education. And they were brave in the paths that they forged since they left here. I'm going to talk just for a minute about each one of them, just kind of embarrass them a little. What I'm going to talk about is not anything that's happened to them since they left school, but the random memories that I have of them when they were students here. The first one who's going to speak this evening is sitting to my right. It's Mark Christensen, and he was one of our original students. He was 14 when he enrolled. He lived in Boston. He had a commute from hell. He'll, he might mention it. I don't know. Maybe he's tried to blot it out. Um, he was always totally, completely devoted to music while he was here. He spent hours and hours practicing Actually, several different instruments, I think. You weren't entirely practicing the French horn all the time. And uh, he was always very, very serious about everything and totally devoted to the school at the same time. So one of the memories I have of him is sitting in the office typing school meeting records. Now, some of you have seen school meeting records. Every week before our school meeting, all the stuff that's on the agenda gets typed out. And now most of it a lot of it's already in the computer for one reason or another, but it gets typed on a computer, a modern thing. At the time, we were using mimeograph stencils. Boy, so, that was fun. <laughs> a lot of people so sitting here, three people sitting here have had a lot of experience with mimeograph stencils, but nobody typed quite as many as Mark. And uh, then there was one other thing about Mark that no one can forget, and his mom is here this evening. And that was Mrs. Christensen's carrot cake, which is still the gold standard in carrot cakes. <laughs> Thank you, Mimsy, for those kind words. I'm really utterly thrilled to be back here at the school at Sudbury Valley some 40 years from me coming here and having a talk with Joni Rubin about what I wanted to do with my life. It's, it's, I'm almost embarrassed to say it was a long time ago. And, and Joni, you still look great. As the oldest person who is a student up here, um, I could probably start rambling right off the top, but why don't I begin by um, telling you where my journey to come to Sudbury Valley began. I had just turned 14 years old, and that was in 1968, a, a quite a time in our country. 
and actually quite a time in my hometown of East Boston where they had just initiated busing um, into the school system. And it was pretty rough. And that was the, the high school that I was about to be enrolled in that fall. And so I think my parents and myself had some trepidation about, <laughs> where, we, where are we sending you here? We're going to put you into this school that's, that's literally a war zone. I mean, the teachers and the students are, are, are at odds with, with each other. Um, the, the community of people wanted to have a community school. They didn't want to have people bust in from, from every part of um, Boston because they, they, they didn't know these people. Rightly or wrongly, um, it was a problem. And <laughs> I looked at what I wanted to do, even at that early age in my life, and said, I'm not sure that I want to go into that fight. I'm not sure that I, uh, is really something that is going to be good for me or my family. So I looked at some of my alternatives, and that spring I had um, taken a test for Boston Technical High School, um, which is, you could call it a Votech high school, but it's, it's a, it was a very um, good school for, for math and science boys. And much to my surprise, I got accepted. And so when, when you're picked for something, it's hard to turn it down. So I, I registered for that school, thinking that I would go there. And it was a heck of a commute to, to get there from where I lived. It, it was at least an hour, an hour and 15 minutes on the subway. And then, then another bus. It was all the way from East Boston to, to basically Roxbury or Dorchester. And so uh, those were my two alternatives. And so that summer, we kind of did some soul searching and thought, well, could we go to a private school? Could we even afford it? Um, is that something I would want to do? And even at that early age of 14, I, as, as Mimti was saying, is that you know, I had uh, even been interested in music at that early age, starting the trumpet at age probably eight or nine. And, and I really did love music, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to do that as my life's calling. But had I accepted um, the offer to go to Boston Technical High School, I would have been channeled immediately into a, a t kind of technical education which you know, there's nothing certainly wrong with that. It's just that I didn't particularly like math or, or even science that much. And, 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 and I was actually quite surprised that I did well enough in that test to be accepted. And so having been accepted, it's an honor. So I, I guess I should go here. Well, in thinking about that, that summer, um, my dad said, well, let's look at maybe some other things. And one of those other things was let's take a look at this Sudbury Valley School. And so that um, summer, not sure if it was June or July, or, but sometime in that <clears throat> summer of 1968 came and um, came upstairs for our, our meeting with, with Joan and my parents. And um, that was really quite a day in my life because um, Joan kind of acted as a therapist, and, 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 and also as a, as a parent. But um, she wasn't my parent, but she was a parent <laughs> to me. And said, well, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do with your life? Um, do you want to go to this technical high school? Do you, you know, that could mean giving up your music, because you're going to be channeled um, into an MIT or and, and maybe I would have been good enough or had the energy to do a couple of different things in my life, such as you know, science background and music. But I didn't think that I had it in me to do that. So I said, you know, I'm not ready to, to give up the past few years of um, a burgeoning interest in, in music and instrumentalism for that. So she said, you're going to be allowed to, do, to pursue your dreams here at Sudbury Valley. And she said it may be a little bit scary at first because we don't have quite the same structure as a, as a Boston Technical High School. 
you, you're, you're, you're going to have to create your own structure here. And I think my next four years, because that summer we decided that I should go here. I should give it a shot. Just give it a shot. Well, I wound up spending four years at Sudbury, graduating in 72. Um, so I, I guess you could say that I was uh, the first four-year class of a high school graduating class. I, I guess I was in that class. So I presented my, my thesis in front of the school meeting that uh, I believe it was April or May. And it was successfully, I guess I successfully defended my thesis that I would be res responsible in the community for, for my life and for uh, my career. And I hopefully showed that. And um, I set forth on basically the rest of my life. Um, that spring, I auditioned for the New England Conservatory of Music um, and got accepted as a freshman French horn player. Um, throughout my years at Sudbury, I was diligently <laughs> practicing the French horn um, and also um, on Saturday mornings going to the New England Conservatory Prep Division, taking lessons um, not only in, in the French horn but also in, in um, additional music theory. And I had ensembles, um, wind ensembles, and uh, I don't think I had orchestra back then, but it was, it was some wind ensemble experience. Um, in the community. Um, we didn't have a band or orchestra here at Sudbury Valley, but we did have a staff member or two who were musicians and um, developed and fostered my education here as a musician, and I, I played um, in small ensembles with them. And they also, um, and to, to mention one in, in particular, that was Jan McDaniel, who um, really helped me a lot in my early days of deciding to become a musician and, and helping me to find my own way to do that. So um, I spent a lot of time here pursuing that dream and uh, I've been lucky enough to, to be in the music profession as a, as a performing um, musician now for some 27 years, making my living at that. And it's, um, um, it's not an easy profession to be in. And many of my teachers have said, you know, Mark, it's, it's really a business because these organizations have to make ends meet. And there, nowadays, there's many creative ways that ensembles have to do that, but so many of them have tremendous deficits if they don't have endowments, and um, that, but that's a whole other story. So anyway, to get back, I, I graduated from, from SVS and went on to the New England Conservatory. Um, after my freshman year there, I, I, I did some soul searching. I had some um, physical problems with braces. And I took a year off uh, trying to figure out what my next move would be. Would I come back to, to New England Conservatory having gotten braces um, and having some, some problems actually playing the French horn in an attempt to make myself play better? I, I got braces. And um, it was kind of a mixed result. And I had high standards for what I wanted to do. So I took the year off, eventually wound up um, having roots in Minnesota at the University of Minnesota. And that's a, <laughs> getting there is a, a whole other story in itself because I didn't have traditional high school transcripts. And so they wanted to know what the heck I was doing for my four years of high school. Well, I had taken my, uh, the SAT test my senior year here, or my fourth year here, and they were respectable, as I, I told Danny earlier tonight. Um, but they made me write a thesis. Uh, what, what have you done? It was, they wanted something like 15 or 20 pages. And so I, I think me just um, presenting my thesis of responsibility at Sudbury Valley to graduate helped me when I got out into the world. And they were saying, we, we don't know what you've done here, and, uh, except for your, your credits from the New England Conservatory, which did transfer over to Minnesota. Um, they said, we don't, we don't know what to call you if you're not going to be um, majoring in the French horn. You've got some music credits here in history and theory of music. But we need to figure out how to, uh, to get you into this institution if we were even going to accept you. So I, I, I wrote a 15-page essay and luckily got accepted. And, and four, years, um, four years and a summer later, I wound up with a degree in 
music, Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, with a specialty in oboe. Now, in my 20th year of life, I switched to the oboe, and it was a very natural fit for me. Um, perhaps those of you that want a little more detail can, can talk to me afterwards of how that exactly happened. But um, four years at Minnesota, wound up with a degree. I then applied to Northwestern University in Chicago, um, and I got in as one of the two graduate students in majoring in oboe, and I got to study with the principal oboist of the Chicago Symphony. Uh, I was his graduate teaching uh, assistant and uh, had a great couple of years there. Really, really wonderful years. I got to play extra in the Chicago Symphony with him, um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was hard. It was, it was very hard because I had taken up the oboe rather late in life, although I had a, a, a real background in music from, from, I, from a young kid. And it was in my heart, it was in my blood, that I needed to be a mu musician. And, and the year that I took off between New England and getting into Minnesota, I did some soul searching and thinking, um, I'm going to go off on a different path. But I, I, I just couldn't do it. I, I had to stay with my music and take that chance. So went to Northwestern, spent an extra year in Chicago after I graduated, <clears throat> freelancing and learning a little bit more about the trade of, of being a professional mu uh, musician. Um, as a freelancer and, and, and hitting the audition circuit. And, and being a professional mu musician is, um, uh, as Nicole and I have talked about, is, is really putting your life on the line for, for what you love to do. Um, and I took a chance that um, I would do this because I had to do this. I, I, I felt that I had to be a musician because it was really everything I had done in my life. I, I, I didn't want to do anything else. And uh, as quite a few of my music teachers have told me, don't do music unless you have to. <laughs> and, and that is kind of a two-sided coin, meaning, yeah, it's a tough business. It's, it's like being an actor in Hollywood where you go to LA and you wait tables and you hope for a lucky break. And if you're good, that helps a lot. But, it, but there's no guarantees. But then again, there's no guarantees in life either. There's, there's some um, perhaps uh, more, uh, how can I put it? There are more uh, ways that are easier, that if you, if you follow a prescribed course, more than likely you'll get to a place that you've tried to get to. But after I graduated from Northwestern and, and, and spent that year in Chicago. Um, I got my first uh, professional job in a, in a symphony orchestra, and, it was, um, and, and I knew that I would probably have to travel um, the world to, uh, uh, to get my start, so to speak. So I, got my, I, I auditioned and got my first job in Mexico City. And I, I spent six months there in, in the Mexico City or the state of Mexico symphony orchestra, and I, and I, I loved it. Um, I, I loved seeing Mexico, I, I, but I hated living there. <laughs> it, it was a, a rough and tumble country, and, uh, but it was the height of the oil boom down there, and they, they had a lot of money that they were devoting to the arts, and they were bringing you know, a lot of foreigners in, a lot of Americans, and, and that's where I got my start. And it was hard, and, and because it was Mexico, the, the conductor felt that he could abuse Americans. And my first few months there, he would uh, have me play my solos in front of the orchestra. He, he said, Lim, you know, Mark, Lim, play that for us. And so I, I kind of got my trial by fire, and that was actually good for me. So at the end of six months, I was uh, actually filling a maternity leave for someone, and the conductor in front of the orchestra said, Mark, I've decided that you can stay. Well, in, in my position in the orchestra, which is it, it's either as an oboist or as an English horn. I was the solo English horn player in the orchestra. That's, that's just one position, one person who does that. Um, one of the viola players um, was the husband of the wife who went on maternity leave. And he was, he was from Guatemala. And there was a bit of a Guatemalan mafia that kind of ran the show there. And I thought, if I take this job, that's going to be a threat to him and his wife. So I said, I don't think so, Maestro. Thank you very much. But I have an, uh, an offer 
um, in Hong Kong. I've actually auditioned. I didn't ac actually know that I had the job, but I decided that I would leave Mexico because I just, um, my stomach couldn't take Mexico. The, I, I, I got Montezuma's revenge just too much of the time. And, um, but it was, it was a beautiful country to see. It was a nice place to visit. But in, in some ways, I hated living there. So I auditioned for my next professional, full-time professional engagement, which was in the Hong Kong Philharmonic. And right after leaving Mexico, I got a telegram. They, they had telegrams back then. Um, and they offered me a position in the Hong Kong Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. And I thought, this is great. They, they pay my way out there. Um, they were offering me a salary. And so I'm, I'm getting paid to do what I love to do. And, and it was um, for the position of solo English horn and associate principal oboe. So I would get to play some principal oboe and, and, and keep playing English horn, which is really an instrument that I love. Now, English horn is different than a French horn. Yeah, I, I said earlier that I started on French horn, but English horn is the bigger relative of the oboe, which is a, a woodwind instrument. So I went to Hong Kong and spent six seasons in Hong Kong, and I, I really, truly loved that. And then I, suddenly, I was in my early 30s and thinking, I perhaps need to come back to the States while I, I maybe still can. And I, I had the option to stay in Hong Kong and um, settle down and, and make a life there. But uh, it never felt to me like it was home or, or would be home, although I, I loved basically every minute I spent there. And I, I felt that it was time for me at that time in my life to so to speak, face the music and, and come back to the States and, and, and see if I could um, win another job. And, and so I, I, I came back, uh, I guess it was the summer of 87. Yeah, summer of 87. I came back to the States and um, hit the audition circuit and had come close to landing jobs. But, you know, at, at, at a music audition, and I'm, I'm sure you can relate to this as... <laughs> As, as a performing artist. Um, a, a music audition is where you may fly anywhere in the country for, for one opening, and there be, may be 50 or 100 other people who are there that same day and want that same job. And so uh, the, um, the knowledge in, in, in the music industry is that maybe only about 2% of people who graduate with a music degree are actually going to get a job. And, and so it's, it's rough. So I hit the audition circuit knowing that I had six good years of professional experience behind me and, and feeling confident that I, I would get something. I, I told myself, I'll probably give it till age 35. And then, but actually at, at that time I enrolled in um, Harvard Night School for some math and science brush up, just in case. <laughs> And it started coming back to me, although a little slowly. <laughs> so I hit the audition circuit and, and spent that summer living um, with my mom. And, and my dad had passed away the previous year. So I, I really felt it was time for me to come back to the States and face the music. And so I, I spent a really hard summer of just working and practicing at my music in an attempt to, to really win uh, a paying job in my profession. And so that October and November, I came close to a job in, in the New Orleans Symphony, which has since kind of disbanded and, and reformulated. And so it, it's probably best that I didn't get that job. Uh, but in November, there was an opening for, for the United States Marine Band job. And, and yes, I am a Marine, a 20-year Marine, uh, 20 years in the Corps. And I'm a, I'm a performing artist in the United States Marine Band, the president's own band. Um, never had to go through, through boot camp because um, in the military, the two professions that, that don't have to do boot camp are the marine musicians, in the marine band specifically, not any field band, and the, the doctors. The Marine Corps doesn't specifically have doctors. The navies are, are, the, are the doctors in, for, for the Marine Corps. But So it, it's those two specialties. And the way they look at it is that our boot camp is our training for what we, we have learned to do in our life. So I, I went to Washington, D.C. and took that audition. And luckily, there were only 30 people at that particular job. A lot of um, classical musicians like myself were, are kind of snobby about playing in a band. But I did some research and, and realized that not only was it a band, a very 
high class or world class band, but it, it also had a chamber orchestra with, with full time string players and also pianists. And it, it, was, it was actually the, the orchestra for the White House. So uh, I auditioned and luckily got accepted. And so I, I moved to Washington, D.C. some 20 years ago. And that's how I come to you today um, with 27 years as a working musician. Um, really being able to have lived my dream, which was nurtured and fostered here. And so that's my story. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to see all of you here, staff members, whom I know and love for such a long time. And it's been, it has been such a long time since I've seen so many of you. Um, also former students, and, um, some of which I've just got to know t tonight, but also others that I, I grew up with. Hal, for instance, and I played soccer out here on the fields when he was much shorter than I was. <laughs> um, so I never forgot Sudbury Valley, but I did lose contact over the years because I've, I've been busy. I've been busy um, leading my life. And uh, it, although my hometown is Boston, I didn't get back here very much in a time when I could actually visit the school. So last October I came and was lucky enough to come uh, on a day when the school was in session and um, got to see some folks and, and then that's how I'm here tonight. But I'm, I'm thrilled to be getting the ball rolling here for the evening and hope to talk to many of you afterwards and um, hope that I've given you a little insight into myself and, and my journey here. But I was just a kid from East Boston who was not sure that this was going to be the right fit for me. But I think in my time here, I, I decided that I was going to make it the right fit for me because uh, I, I didn't think that I had too many other choices. And so I, I think we all choose to be, um, uh, success can be a choice. And you certainly can do that here for your children or for, for you students that are here. Um, you can go in any path that you like, you just have to decide what that is going to be in your own mind. And that can change too. But, but you can do that here. And you can do it on a very high level. And there is going to be a, a future for you for whatever you do. So I want to thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing my colleagues next. Our next speaker is Janine Moore, and um, to me, the most amazing fact about Janine is that when I first met her, she was shy <laughs> and scared. <laughs> I think she was probably school phobic. She was about 14, and she was kind of hard to get to know because she was, uh, she was, she was, a few people eventually got to talk to her, but not that many adults. Anyway, it took me a while to get to know the depth and the um, range of knowledge that she already had when she came here, which sort of were a, uh, a little hint about who she would become. For instance, the first thing, the first thing that I remember finding out about her that was, uh, didn't fit anything else was that she knew everything under the sun about tropical fish, Here's this poor little scared teenager, and <laughs> she knew everything you could possibly know about tropical fish. And this is the 80s, uh, in the beginning of the computer age for most of us, and she could program things without even thinking about it, which was also kind of, you know, where did that come from? But she, did t she took all this stuff for granted. Not every teen in the 80s, like every teen now, could do all these things, but she could. Uh, she had a great breadth of interests, and I think that she has put them together in a way that has brought her to where she is now, which she's going to tell you about. But there's one other thing about her. She can run anything. She can run anybody. She can manage anything, except perhaps her children. I'm not sure about that, because <laughs> they're probably as strong as she is, in including she's, it's very easy to her, for her to run, or it was very easy for her to run, the rather obstreperous people who work at Sudbury Valley. Thank you, 
Lindsay. I actually spent some time this evening trying to think what she might say, and what she might remember about me, because all the staff members seem to remember something that you've conveniently forgotten. <laughs> um, I guess I'd like to start by just telling you how I got to Sudbury Valley, and, and then sort of what I did here in brief, and where I went after. Um, I think I remember, actually, my first physical fight with my mother to not go to school. I was five years old. I was in, the, I was in our kitchen. <laughs> the little bus came to the bottom of the driveway, tooted its horn, and I grabbed the chair rail. And my mother was like, no, you're going to school. And she grabbed me and started pulling, and I just held on to the chair rail harder. <laughs> And I'm sure there was kicking and, and yelling involved in the class, but I remember eventually um, what seemed like an eternity for me, but was probably 30 seconds to a minute in, in reality. She said, okay, you don't have to go. And I remember the relief. And she waved the bus on, and I was like, shoo, we don't have to go. And for my whole childhood, actually, for, through grade school, that's what it was like. So. The physical fights ended, but every month or so, I decided, nope, don't want to go, take a couple days off, two, three days. My mother at that time, I think, had just resigned herself to the fact that I wasn't going to go. <laughs> and um, come about 12, 13, I, I really just stopped going. And it was at the point where the truant officer said to my mother, well, we're going to have to come and get her in handcuffs and take her to school. And uh, thankfully, my mother said, that's not such a good idea. <laughs> and we heard about Sudbury Valley. And I came. Um, it was late June. It was right at the end of school and interviewed with Hannah. And we interviewed downstairs um, in the old office, although I don't know what you call it now because it's not the old office anymore. <laughs> um, and I remember there was swans on the pond. And it was very peaceful. And everyone seemed so happy. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, because there was people everywhere. And they were just seemed to be doing their own thing. And um, we interviewed with Hannah. And I remember, the only, the only thing I really remember you saying, Hannah, was, you know, shy people sometimes turn out to be social butterflies here. <laughs> and I remember thinking, no, that's never going to happen. <laughs> Um, and actually, I enrolled mostly because I didn't have a choice. I, I knew handcuffs was the other option. Didn't think that was such a good option. No, sorry. <laughs> I mean, it was intriguing. Actually, I, I thought it was too good to be true. I didn't actually believe it. And I remember talking to a friend over the summer, and I had the catalog, and her reading it and saying, that can't be true. And me thinking, I didn't actually admit it to her, but I was thinking the same thing. This really can't be true. But um, I enrolled and, and came. And I would say it took a good year to, to really get comfortable and, and to really even start comprehending what was going on here. Um, I remember thinking, this is great school for teenagers, but I don't know who would ever send their four-year-old here. Um, of course, that changed. <laughs> but you know, my first year was really getting to know people and getting to understand what was going on, or just formulating what might happen every day. And, and my second year, I really came, you know, got my stride and started to get to know more people and started to do more things. Um, and this whole time, I had a love for horses. I grew up with older siblings. My my sister rode. She we were fortunate enough to have a couple of horses when I was a child. And I rode with her, and I, and I always loved doing that. And I continued to do that at Sabre Valley. I, ha I had a horse of my own at that point. Um, but I didn't just ride my horse. I wasn't solely focused. I did a lot of photography here. Um, I did some cooking. I, I um, did traveling. I uh, worked in the office a lot. I was school meeting chairman. I, I ended up doing a lot of different things. Um, and I left here five years after I started, really feeling like I was ready to move on, but really had no clue what I was going to do. 
and I left and started managing a retail store. I had also had part-time jobs doing working in retail and I left and had the opportunity to manage a retail store, a gift store, and I I took it. You know, it wasn't it was great, it paid some bills, it wasn't my love, but I was doing it. And I did that for about um two years or so when I got a call from Mimsy or Danny, I actually don't remember which, and said, you know, Judy, who was working in the office at the time, had to take leave of absence. Would I come work in the office for a couple months? Sure, that sounds good. I'll do that. So I came and, and worked in the office, and we had a good time. It was, it was interesting working in the office. Instead of being a student, it was definitely different, um, but somewhat the same different because I had to separate myself from being a student to actually working in within the school. Um, and I worked in the school for a couple years and I said, you know what, I, I really want to do something that means something to me. I want to, you know, I love the school, but I really feel like I need to, you know, step away and, and do something different. And since I had the love of horses on my life, I really wanted to do something with horses. However, you don't make a lot of money doing things with horses. <laughs> Actually, you lose a lot of money doing things with horses. So I was in this quandary. What am I going to do? Um, you know, I don't want to train. I'm not going to make any money that way. I don't want to breed. I'm not going to make any money that way. And it suddenly dawned on me that one of the biggest retailers of equestrian goods was down the street. 